Hey, everybody. Uh, it's Joe Wachutis here from Electrify Now and NBI. Here with my teammate, as always, Brian Stewart. Welcome to our webinar, Cold Climate Heat Pumps, Warm Homes on the Coldest Days. We are really excited about this webinar. We've had our greatest registration for any webinar uh, in our history. So huge round of applause uh, to all of you for coming and really happy to uh, kick this off. I just want to put a, a, a quick shout out out there. Folks want to put in the chat where they're uh, coming in from. We always love to hear um, where folks are tuning in from. So go ahead and throw it in the chat. Let me know if there are any problems with that. So yeah, welcome, welcome. Uh, we are Electrify Now. If this is your first time on an Electrify Now webinar, um, we are an all-volunteer organization that believes that electrification is the uh, clearest path to a decarbonized uh, society. And we boil down uh, our electrification message into four uh, easy steps. Number one, clean up your electric supply through uh, solar panels on your roof, community solar, ut utilities, uh, clean energy uh, plans. Uh, then number two, electrify your home. Uh, we're going to be talking about that today, one important part of the home. And we have lots of information on our uh, YouTube page all of our previous webinars explaining just how to do that. Just Google Electrify Now YouTube. Uh, number three is Electrify Your Ride, uh, be it a bike or a car. I, again, a lot of information on our website, electrifynow.net or on our YouTube page. And then number four is Electrify Everyone. Uh, so huge thank you to everyone who has donated uh, in this webinar or in other webinars <clears throat> to our Electrify Everyone program. This is run through the nonprofit Community Energy Project. 100% of your donations go right to this program where they are replacing uh, old uh, inefficient uh, gas water heaters with clean electric heat pump water heaters that save families $1,500 uh, and uh, tons of CO2, literally tons of CO2 over the lifetime of these, uh, these uh, water heaters. Uh, we've replaced over um, uh, 55 water heaters uh, to date through the Electrify Everyone program, and this program has even replaced more through other funding sources. So uh, thank you to all of you for that. Uh, a big shout out to our Electrify Coalition. These are organizations, for-profits and nonprofits who believe in electrification and want to help uh, folks understand how to do it. Uh, so if you're interested in joining, there's no cost, uh, uh, just email Brian or I, our emails on, on our website, we put them in the chat. Okay, and then a quick shout out to, uh, for our next webinar we've just announced, that'll be on tankless gas water heaters and the infamous methane puff. Um, we have a team uh, from Stanford University that uh, conducted some really incredible um, uh, science on how uh, gas water heaters uh, emit a methane puff every time they turn on, uh, and this negates some of their climactic uh, uh, benefits. Um, gas water heaters sell seven times as many as heat pump water heaters, so we, we really want to uh, talk about this uh, topic. So join us in January. I'll put a link to the chat in the chat for this uh, registration. All right, Brian, let's dive into our cold climate heat pumps. Why are we talking about these today? Okay, well, uh, this is a great topic because uh, obviously a lot of people are interested in this, but I think you got to start why we're talking about heat pumps kind of in, in general. And, and that's because there's a huge portion of our, you know, global emissions that come from heating buildings. And this is information from the U.S. EPA, which um, breaks down greenhouse gas emissions from various sources. And you can see with this red bar here at the bottom that about 13 percent of our country's emissions come from essentially um, heating our residential and commercial buildings. There's a little bit of that we'll, which will be from cooking, but it's primarily from heating. So it's a big chunk of our overall emissions and our own homes are a big part of that, which is why it's important for us to understand the options we have to create zero carbon heating. And there's been multiple studies on this done from tons of different organizations, um, third-party organizations across the country, that all reach the same conclusion that electrification of our buildings is the, the lowest cost and the most effective way to decarbonize our, our buildings. A lot of these studies are regional, but if any of you are interested, this one in the center here from uh, UC Davis is one of my favorites because they directly compare a, a really high efficiency gas furnace to a heat pump um, and take long range emissions um, data from the electric grid and show that Everywhere in the United States today, a heat pump will produce far fewer emissions than uh, a gas furnace. 
And even with the grid in the state it is today, and of course, as the grid gets cleaner, this is going to be more and more the case. So we know that electrification works from a decarbonization standpoint, and we know that these heat pumps work in many situations. But the question that a lot of people will have is, will they work in my area where it's, you know, and everyone experiences cold in the winter, unless you're in the southern parts of the United States where heat pumps have been popular for decades. In the more northern parts of the country, it's a question, even here, we live on the West Coast, um, it's relatively mild climate, but even here, there can be this storyline that says, well, when it gets cold, heat pumps don't quite work. But imagine if you're living in, you know, Montana or Minnesota or Maine, which who, and we're going to hear from um, that a lot about Maine later on today. Um, that question of, you know, working in cold weather becomes really important because nobody wants a cold home. So that's why we're going to dive into this whole conversation about cold climate heat pumps, which are kind of the, the most high tech version of heat pumps, maybe if you want. I love this image from Daikin. Um, but we're going to really dive in with our panelists to what is a cold climate heat pump and how it's different than other heat pumps that you, we might be familiar with. And importantly, what are the outside temperatures that these systems will operate in? Um, what are good applications for this technology? And how much do they cost in terms of, you know, comparing to other um, types of systems? And are there special building requirements that are needed in order to make them work? And then we're going to hear um, very great information from our, our friends in Maine who have been installing these things um, for quite some time and have some really good data about um, how they work there, including information from customers' um, um, perceptions. And then at the end, we'll we'll come back to this idea about incentives because I think everyone is interested in, in what's happening, particularly with the IRA around incentives that might make installing these things more affordable. So that's kind of our run of show. I want to introduce our, our great panelists. We're going to first hear from uh, our first two panelists from Mitsubishi and Daikin. Sean Lamonds is the Performance Construction Manager at Mitsubishi Electric Train and uh, specifically focused on HVAC and efficient cooling and heating systems for residential new construction. He has um, tons of experience in this area and multiple um, certifications. I've only listed a few of them here because there are too many to fit on the page, but basically uh, suffice it to say he's got a lot of uh, experience with ways of measuring building efficiency. And since 2009, he's been compl um, completed analysis of over 6 million square feet of residential and commercial buildings. So he's got a wealth of knowledge on this exact topic um, from a practical standpoint. We also, And then we have his uh, kind of colleague um, competitors, but they're friendly competitors. I can tell you that from having worked with them both, um, both really great guys, and they I think they respect each other. Um, you, because we're really talking about the two market leaders here, Mark Mitsubishi and, and Daikin. I kind of like to tell people that Japan has been at the epicenter of development of the modern heat pump and it's their climate it includes some very cold spaces. So it's no coincidence that they've created products that really work for um, Japan and then obviously around the world. Jonathan is the business development manager for Daikin North America, and he's a nationally regarded expert in residential contracting and heat pumps. He's also a co-owner of the Heat Pump Store, which is one of our um, one of our uh, members in the Electrify Coalition and a great organization here in, in Oregon that's installed thousands and thousands of heat pumps, um, primarily focused on, on ductless systems. And this is a great kind of like double we have with, with Jonathan because he's got experience on the installation side and also from the, the manufacturing side. Um, and so those are our two... Um, manufacturing uh, partners who we're gonna be talking today. Then I wanna introduce um, Laura Martell. She's the research and evaluation manager from Efficiency Maine. She'll be um, kind of bringing us home with more real detailed information on application of this technology in a very cold part of the country. Efficiency Maine Trust is the independent administrator for programs that promote energy efficiency, alternative energy resources and carbon savings in Maine. Here, the equivalent is, is called the Energy Trust of Oregon, but in many states, there are these organizations that really promote energy efficiency. And they so they drive these big programs where you can get a lot of really good detail and data. Laura has more than 18 years of technical leadership and project management experience, um, researching and evaluation, uh, evaluating these applications of heat pumps and other technologies. She's got a BS degree in ocean engineering from Florida Atlantic University, so I'm not quite sure how she 
ended up in Maine. Maybe she can tell us that later. Uh, but and she also has a master's of engineering in acoustics from Penn, Penn State. So first of all, welcome and thank you to our three panelists. You're going to hear first from um, Sean and uh, Jonathan. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to those two to get us started. Well, and while they're getting those loaded up, folks, uh, please put your questions in the Q&A and leave comments in the chat. That's the easiest way for us to filter. So yeah, turn it over to you guys. All right. Grab this uh, screen here, and I think we should be good to go. Let's see. Of course, a little uh, delay. There we go. You guys see my screen? Yes. All right. Perfect. Thanks so much. Appreciate it, Brian. Appreciate it, Joe. Uh, Jonathan, you and I are uh, are going to have a little conversation around some of this stuff. We've got about 15 slides or so, and um, so we invite people to ask questions. I think we're going to take a little bit of question and answer right at the end um, and then hand it over to Laura. So uh, we're going to dig in. What are cold climate heat pumps? Short answer is cold climate heat pumps are designed to work in cold temperatures. It's a it's I know it's a it's a it's a hard sell there. You know, it's a it's a brainiac moment there, but we want to talk about some of the specifics here, obviously. Um, some of you may have heard uh, about the polar vortex that hit Chicago a couple of years back, a few years back now. Uh, this is These are screenshots from a video I took when I was up there with a colleague. Um, these heat pumps were operating when the high temperature, the daytime high temperature were was negative 20 degrees. So it was negative 20 or colder for three days in a row. Systems are up and running. That's a cold climate heat pump. Uh, another example, more of a high elevation example. So to dispel the, the worry about um, higher altitude and air density and such uh, questions about that. But this is a field test up in Aspen ski area, snow mass ski area. And uh, this is at the patrol hut and warming hut uh, at 11,300 foot. And um, the, just this past year, this past December, they had the biggest storm in 43 years with 100 inches of snow in December and 66 inches of that happened in nine days. Yes, this system has had some challenges at these extreme conditions, but throughout the year, as long as the system is operating properly and the snow is cleared away, uh, the they have been able to turn off the electric resistance breakers in this building and it's handling the heat for this life safety building. Uh, so I'm gonna hand this over to, to Jonathan. So Jonathan, What's your opinion of a heat pump and where do we go to find that information on this? Yeah, for, thanks, Sean. And I, I love being on the same presentation with you. This is a real uh, treat, thanks to Electrify Now for getting me and my buddy, Sean, together. I always learn a ton from Sean. So he's one of my most valuable um, you know, friends in the industry. Um, beyond the fact that, yeah, we have lots of experience with these heat pumps working, how would a consumer know and how would someone shop intelligently for a heat pump and and there are standards that you can draw on although the definitions that found in these standards kind of differ depending on who you ask so like utilities and government programs rely on something called the NEEP cold climate list um, NEEP stands for northeast uh, energy efficiency partners um, a regional energy efficiency organization that has really um, pioneered this uh, standard setting around a cold climate heat pump. Um, soon, um, start of the year, Energy Star will also start defining cold climate heat pumps, and their standards align, if not nearly exactly, pretty darn, yeah, pretty close to exactly with the NEEP standard. Um, now, manufacturers like Mitsubishi and Daikin have brand standards around cold climate heat pumps, something a little bit different. Um, and Mitsubishi produces a brand called Hyperheat to identify their cold climate heat pump products. Daikin has Aurora, uh, Panasonic Exterios, and I could go on and on and on through very successful and reliable brands um, that are in the marketplace. And I think um, for most of these um, manufacturers, the brand standard could be a very useful way for a consumer to identify a cold climate heat pump. I, Sean and I conferred in creating this content, and we think some people feel that if a heat pump, a modern heat pump uses variable capacity or inverter technology, 
that this by definition makes it a cold climate heat pump. We don't agree. And so we have a few other uh, additional things that we'd like to throw out, which we think define a cold climate heat pump. Um, so with that being said, let's dive into it. Um, there are a few key metrics that most groups, including the brand standards that um, Sean and I's company uh, have created. And there's, let's just review these really quickly. Um, to sell products in the US, we have to go through a, a rating process and 47 degrees Fahrenheit is a standardized um, uh, rated temperature and which we have to produce um, a number for. And so this is one of the important things, but for cold climates, like 47 degrees isn't that cold. Um, and so it's perhaps not useful, but it is a number that becomes important as you'll see in a minute. Um, the maximum performance at five degrees is a really important metric for cold climate heat pumps. At five degrees, we are cold. And the total capacity of a heat pump at that uh, the maximum performance or total capacity is a really important, useful number. Most manufacturers, at least in their technical brochures, produce these numbers for consumers to look at. And at the end of the day, a consumer buying a heat pump, you're buying a heating appliance. So knowing its total capacity at five degrees can be really, I think, a useful number. Although the needs of the space, of course, will make that number most relevant. And so you need to know that piece of information to really put that maximum performance at five degrees um, to use. There's a ratio of numbers one and two, and this becomes really important to a lot of programs. They wanna see this ratio of performance be really high. And so for Dyke and, and Mitsubishi, our brand standards are nearly, nearly identical. We, we, uh, our brand for cold climate says we will have 100% of the rated capacity still capable and being produced at five degrees. And so I think that's a really important number. Neep and, and um, Energy Star have a much lower number. And Sean, I think we're, we're in agreement, right? That we think that 100% is really important and useful. Finally, moving along, coefficient of performance. This is an energy efficiency measure. To put it most simply, it's the amount of heat output uh, as a ratio of the amount of energy used to produce those heat. And it's a, a really great number. Heat pumps, really great cold climate heat pumps produce coefficients of performance at two or higher down even well below zero. And um, the, the NEEP and Energy Star standard is actually below two at five degrees. And um, yeah, it's not super rigorous, but it's still very efficient and it's an important number. Now, finally, and this is something both of our brand standards um, uh, you know, conform to, is publishing rated performance of heat output at very cold temperatures. Each brand's a little different. Um, Sean and I both work at companies that will some, mostly use negative 13 as our published performance um, floor or bottom. Um, but some of our models, we actually, at Daikin, we produce down to negative 15. One of our competitors produces down to negative 22. Um, when you're really cold in climate zones six and seven, those numbers become really important yeah. for heating contractors. Too. I'll add into that too. It depends yeah. on the model. There's, I think all manufacturers that have produce high quality will have a range of, of, you know, um, maximum low temperature operation, guaranteed operation is terminology. Um, but just to, to move along here, there's, this is a bit of an eye chart on, um, you know, depends on who you ask, what is a cold climate heat pump, whether it be programmatic in the first column, whether it be brand opinions in the middle column and in the, the right column, you know, uh, Jonathan and I had some ideas about, you know, what does that, what does this really mean? Yeah, we agree that uh, performance at 47 and 13 and five are, uh, are numbers that need to be looked at. But I underlined capacity at design temperature. And I think that's a really key piece. So rather than just looking at the capacity ratio, which is a tested metric um, that you're going to see in cold climate equipment selection, 
it's really important to work with skilled uh, HVAC designers or professionals to look at what is the capacity of the system at that design temperature. Is it going to do the job, deliver the heat to meet the heating load for the house for comfort uh, specifically? And, uh, and a key piece there is looking at equipment that is purpose-built for cold winter comfort, right? That's this additional criteria. I also want to point out that the, the, the negative 13, that is that relates to, I want to say, um, I don't I hope I get don't get this wrong, but I think it's negative 25 uh, Celsius. And so looking at that, that is a test metric number, not a limitation necessarily. There the equipment, um, many of the uh, pieces of equipment will operate much lower than that. We just, it's not a tested and published number. Um, so moving on to uh, the, the more a little bit more on the additional criteria, I'm not going to go through all of these items necessarily, but just thinking about what sets a cold climate apart, cold climate heat pump apart from the standard heat pump. It's going to be looking at um, possibly the inverter compressors poss and, and the motors that go into this and the efficiency of use over time rather than this on and off cycle uh, that you see with typical one and two speed systems. Um, looking at the programming, the algorithms, how does this system handle these patterns? And uh, one key item is looking at a hot, hot discharge air temperature and just right airflow uh, for matching up, you know, the need with the capability. And the uh, looking at defrost cycles but, and the defrosting of the drain pans, various pe small pieces of equipment and logic that goes into the equipment, um, uh, optional wind baffles and other design options that can be applied by skilled HVAC designers, skilled contractors, working, even um, getting training and knowledge from your distributors and the manufacturers, because these are the folks that are working with this equipment and, and understand maybe the, the deeper dive details on this equipment uh, to properly apply them in your situation. Go ahead on this one, Jonathan. I like your take yeah, on Yeah, and it's worth, worth noting too, like through our experience at the heat pump store, like 20,000 homes, even a stated cold climate heat pump is not always really excellent in all the ways that Sean just illustrated on that slide. And so, you know, looking at reviews, talking to people who have um, have a heat pump in a cold climate, like Maine, for instance, um, not much, all much cold climate heat pumps are alike. And that's the point I wanted to take away with is maybe getting some opinions on people, um, um, how they have to maintain it, if at all, how they had to adjust it in extreme weather, if at all. Those are good indicators. So yeah, moving to the next slide, Sean. Um, where are cold climate heat pumps used? This was a, per a particular conversation point that Brian and Sean and I had in preparing for this presentation. Sean and I believe that this climate zone map can be a little misleading for people. Cold climates are typically in areas which you see as five, six, and seven on this map. And there are eight and nine and 10 up in Alaska and, and Canada, of course, too. But for this map, five, six, and seven are the traditional kind of cold climate areas. Um, and one would think, well, that must be where these cold climate heat pumps are best suited. And I have found through my experience living and working in climate zone four um, that we love using cold climate heat pumps again because they are purpose built as designed, uh, purpose built to make heating comfort and be easy to operate in, in inclement weather. And when you look at the black line that I drew on this map, it's kind of this long standing heat pump um, business that above that line roughly, more of the equipment hours of operation in a year are spent heating. We call them in the HVAC industry, a heating dominated area or climate. And in my mind, anything above that dotted line, certainly in climate zones four, um, is probably a great location for a cold climate heat pump. Not because you absolutely need it, but we think you know it's going to give you so many of the features, benefits, and comfort aspects that will give you a great experience with a heat pump. Area below the line, more time spent cooling, Sorry. and at that point, you know, yeah. So I think you're up next, John. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Um, didn't mean to jump jump ahead there. Um, well, just looking at some guidelines, right? So to summarize, heating dominant climates frequent snow and ice and maritime climates in, you know, thinking about cold rain and fog that could be, you know, upper Northeast, Northwest, et cetera. 
Um, and then thinking about a few guidelines, think about wind direction. Uh, these pictures are kind of small. I apologize for the eye chart here, but thinking about wind direction, thinking about drainage of water, where does that cold condensate water in the winter come out and possibly freeze and cause uh, hazards that you want to avoid. And then also measures for snow, whether it be snow baffles or watching out for drip lines and roof lines, uh, or just fully covered under a deck or something along those lines. All considerations for good cold climate guidelines. And then looking at this chart, and it's a pretty simplified chart, but it, it does get the point across that a standard heat pump in the blue line there versus a cold climate heat pump in the, with the red line. Um, and that, that red line, from our perspectives, for our manufacturers, we're looking at 100% capacity at five degrees and starting to stretch into that uh, those negative numbers on full capacity. And then that tapering off and that broadening range there at the left side, that really depends on the model that you're talking about. You know, the good, better, best, the features that it comes with, uh, which which model uh, are you looking at? Sorry, now, Sean, can I jump in on it? Because I think that slide is really helpful. I mean, in, in the, the standard heat pump line there is important because basically what that's saying is that as, it get, as the temperature gets colder, the heat pump is able to produce less heat. And that can be a real problem if your home needs more than those numbers of you know, BTUs that it's putting out as the temperature gets colder so because it because if, if you had a line that showed what the house needs it would be a, a a line angling up from the bottom lower left lower right going up right basically because it needs more as the temperature so i don't know can you just chat on that a little bit because that's 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 an essential part of this whole load calculation thing that a good hvac uh installer yeah. is going to be doing right yeah so um as the temperature drops the heat demand goes higher but with a standard heat pump that uh, it's an inverse relationship. As the temperature drops, it's less capable of delivering heat into the house. And so that can be great down to that 40 degrees, 30 degrees, 20 degrees type of type of range. That could be a decent matchup with a dual fuel uh, um, system consideration. And that's probably where we're going to see a lot of expansion in the heat pump market is that dual fuel application. Uh, so that another heating system, whether it be a uh, natural gas furnace or other that is tied uh, into the control system can take over and start to heat that house as the temperature drops. That you know That is a, a viable pathway that we as an industry see um, uh, significant growth in. And just know that these between these two lines, there's a range of equipment um, that fall, you know, either below above or below um, whichever these lines we're talking about. These are just generalized uh, explanations of cold versus standard heat pumps. So it's going to depend on the model you're looking at and the NEEP cold climate heat um, heat pump. Uh, list is a great way to 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 look at that. We're not going to spend much time on that or time on that today, but I'm looking forward to Laura's information as she explores um, that information. I'm gonna I'm gonna take the risk of a of a slippery wonky slide down the technical uh, uh, hole here. What I want to point out with this slide is to demystify how a heat pump works real quick. The blue side is, is low pressure. The, the orange side is high pressure, if you will. The compressor in the middle pressurizes that refrigerant to deliver heat inside. And as that refrigerant goes back through that expansion valve, depressurizes, cools off, it can now absorb the energy that's in the air on the outside, and then just gets recompressed and pushed back in. So it is a it is a cycle that holds onto the refrigerant and it just manages temperatures and pressures of that refrigerant to absorb heat up from outside, deliver it inside. And by the way, this is how any air conditioner works in reverse in the summer. So that's as geeky as I'm going to get on that mm -hmm. for today. Uh, go ahead, Jonathan, on this one. Yeah, and it, but it's a good teeing up to like this slide where we try to show you how these cold heat, heat pump, cold climate heat pumps actually achieve this magic. It's that um, in the earlier slide, we saw how they can maintain performance as temperatures drop. And in that previous slide, we saw how the refrigerant cycle works. Cold climate heat pumps have these whiz-bang technology, for lack of a better word, like variable speed compressors. As it's cold, the compressor can work harder and move faster. 
The fans can do the same. The expansion valve is electronic. It's not fixed. And so it can fire faster to um, change the pressure to an incredible exacting amount. Um, and of course, there's a very intelligent computer with an algorithms and, and lots of programming specific to cold climate operations that make all of this happen. But you might not notice all of these com special components and programming from the outside because they don't, these machines don't look really very much different. Now, because the heritage, the technology came from Asia to begin with and Japan really to start with, they are small compact units that are what we call side discharge. And whereas in America, most air conditioners and heat pumps are cube shaped and rather large, we have more space and it's just what we had developed technologically over time. So cold climate heat pumps really, you might have two side discharge machines and you, they wouldn't know if one was cold climate or the other, except for maybe some branding on the outside. Um, and yeah, moving to the next slide, um, the, the cost then becomes, I think, the next question that most people ask us. I think because of some of the special features and programming, typically you can expect a cold climate model to be 20 to 30% more for the equipment cost um, compared to a non-cold climate model. But I'd like to point out that when you buy a heating appliance and heating and cooling appliance, you're paying for the ability of that machine to make BTUs. And in my experience, looking at lots of performance tables of these units over the years, I found that the amount of heat produced by a cool climate model is much more. And so dollar spent per BTU created, it, I think that the cool climate heat pumps ultimately become a better value. Um, I'm speaking in generalities here. Every model is a little bit different. But in my experience, with the, well, frankly, with the brands that come out of Japan that I've been most familiar with over the years, I can say that this can be the case for cold climate models. Sure. Yeah, and and along with that, there's there's so many choices and so many details, and as these things get more complex, um, you know, it, it is a challenging challenge to identify the details. So I wanted to point out a little bit, you know, some some teachable moments here. On the left side, we've got. Uh, I just saw this last week, uh, actually in Spokane, Washington, doing a visit, and uh, four systems on the wall. Three of the four do not have um, any kind of uh, condensate management. The top two are dripping down towards the bottom two. The one on the right, top right, actually has a pan that's going to drip that refrigerant out past the lower unit. And clearly there's less ice buildup on the one that's the bottom right there. Um, and I sure wouldn't want to live in that or sleep in that bedroom that those are attached to. That would be a little bit rough, I think. Uh, some other items in here. Um, looking at if you've got frost on the indoor coil, there's a good chance you're looking at a cross wired uh, system where the communication and the refrigerant flow are not aligned to the proper, you know, they're, they're not uh, lined up in terms of, you know, indoor system one is not necessarily receiving the right signal or the refrigerant at the same time. So indications of an issue. Uh, the line sets, both line sets need to be insulated. So on this image right there, that line set is, uh, that, that smaller line set is not uh, insulated. That's the refrigerant piping that goes between the indoor and the outdoor. And then the uh, a few other items about airflow, making sure you've got good airflow around the outdoor units on the right side, a tall fence, tight space, maybe not lifted up off the ground to, for clearance for ice and snow buildup, et cetera, all considerations. And then also dust and debris, maybe during construction or remodel. It's hard to see in that image, but that, uh, that fan, I'm, I'm looking inside a unit and taking a picture of a fan, and you can see a swipe of my finger across that fan just removing a bunch of dust. And that's really hard on the coils uh, to make them operate long-term properly. This is a, an article from uh, G, uh, Green, Building, um, sorry, Green Building Alliance. The, um, the, um, the issues here, we're not going to go through them, but it's a great example. If you want to check it out, go read it up. The, it's an interesting kind of natural case study, if you will, of 
what were some of the challenges? What were some of the things that were done? What were the outcomes and the causes of those outcomes? And there's some good discussion in that, in that, um, on that article about oversizing, about correct uh, heating and cooling loads, or thinking about humidity management, over zoning, how many pieces of equipment are inside this house that where the insulation, the air sealing, and the windows have been improved and the loads have dropped. It's a great discussion about um, you know, some, uh, some items to think about and the details that do matter on that. And as we finish up here, I want to point out we've got massive work ahead of us as a country and as a world. And so we want to remember, I just like the concept of, you know, perfect can uh, is the enemy of good per Vol Voltaire a while back. And an updated version, perfection is the enemy of done. So we've got a lot of work to do. It doesn't have to be perfect, but we do need to pay attention to the details. And rest assured, we can get this done. You know, these 14 year time frames from 1935 and 1955, we got a lot of really important, valuable, uh, long term work done in short period of time. And I think we can do that as a country and as a world. So thanks for the opportunity, everybody. Yeah, thank thanks you so much. much. Yeah, thanks, thanks guys. guys. Um, Brian, I'm just wondering, looking at the time, if we want to go right to Laura. Yeah, let's just go question? straight to, let's, I think that was really useful. I think I asked the one question I really wanted to in the middle there. But let's um, let's go to, to Laura, and then we can come back with some general questions I think maybe everyone can answer. Yeah. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Laura, you're on mute there. There we go. It did not want to take me off mute for some reason. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Laura Martell from Efficiency Maine, and I'm going to take you through some slides of some of the um, heat pump activity that we have had um, in Maine. So I wanted to start off just showing you what we've done in the past five years. Um, our fiscal years run uh, July to June, so that fiscal year 2022 just ended this past June. Uh, between 20 and 21, our governor announced a heat pump challenge to install 100,000 heat pumps by 2025, and uh, Efficiency Maine responded to that by restructuring our program and offering some enhanced incentives. And you can see uh, we more than doubled our program activity between 2020 and 2021, and we are on track to not only hit that 100,000 heat pump challenge, but to, to blow it out of the water. Um, so we've been doing this for a while. We did our first um, round of residential heat pumps back in 2012 with a handful that went into low-income multifamily buildings. So we've, we've been at it for a while. A little bit of the um, background on, on heating in Maine. So heating, Maine is a oil dominated um, state. We have in existing homes, the highest penetration of, of oil heating, I think in the country. And so this is three different studies looking at three different time frames. The 2008 study and the 2021 study were both looking at new construction that were completed within three years of those studies. And the 2015 looked at all of the existing housing stock in Maine. So that was, you know, we had homes from the seventies and the sixties included in that assessment. And I'll draw your attention to the large orange that you can't possibly miss in the left and middle charts that is almost non-existent in the chart on the right. Um, oil, um, oil boilers in particular, um, are fading in new construction. And one of the things that's replacing it, in fact, probably the largest, um, fastest growing aside from propane, which is a whole other discussion, um, is heat pumps. So at the top there in the, the gray, red, and dark blue are the heat pump contributions. So the red is heat pumps alone, so no other heating source in the home aside from heat. Blue is heat pumps with an electric resistance. Um, and actually the other heat pump one is that green bar, which is having a, a furnace, um, a propane furnace along with a heat pump. So 20% of homes in Maine that, have, that were built between 2017 and 2020 um, had all electric heating. 
most of those had just heat pumps and other the other ones had heat pumps and electric resistance. Uh, and when we say electric resistance, generally what we're talking about is either a backup element in the air handler or some small sections of electric baseboard in odd spaces like bathrooms or back rooms. So uh, a little bit about cost and what we have seen in Maine. So for a new construction home, uh, the cost to put in a boiler is around $11,000. That includes all of the um, distribution. So the piping, the fins, the radiators, all of that. Um, but it doesn't include any cooling where the cost of a heat pump system, which is made up of ductless units. So these are the units um, when we're talking about cold climate heat pumps, that's often what we're talking about. It's a it's an outdoor unit with an indoor unit. Sometimes there's one outdoor unit to multiple indoor units, but we're talking about um, a non-centralized system where we have individual air handlers in specific rooms to provide the distribution of the system. And it's the refrigerant rather than air or water that is being uh, moved around to provide to provide that distribution. So the cost for that is around $13,000. The, the difference is about $2,500. Um, and as I mentioned again, the boiler doesn't come with cooling. So if, if that home requires cooling in addition to heating, that is gonna be an extra expense uh, that needs to be added to that boiler solution. And the chart on the right is showing the operational costs of heat pumps um, versus um, a high performance heat pump, um, sorry, the high performance heat pump is the green line. The blue line is a standard efficiency heat pump. Um, and I'm using national average cost here. So the cost of electricity is just under 16 cents per kWh. The purple line is natural gas based on uh, $2.56 cents per therm. So that would be um, like a natural gas boiler or furnace. Oil is the red line at the top there at 546 a gallon, and propane is the blue line in the middle at $2.66. So you'll notice that the, the natural gas, oil, and propane are flat lines. They're horizontal because it doesn't matter what the outdoor temperature is, every BTU that gets produced costs the same amount um, based on the, the fuel costs. Heat pumps are a little bit different. Right, you saw the chart that was shown before that showed that the efficiency of the heat pump drops as the outdoor temperature drops because it's trying to extract heat from colder and colder air. And, and the colder the air gets outside, the harder it is to extract that heat. That causes the, the coefficient of performance to go down, which means that it costs more. You have to use more electricity to produce the same amount of heat at those colder temperatures. And that's what creates these curves. And I would draw your attention to the um, intersections of those curves with the horizontal lines. Each one of those intersections is the point at which the outdoor temperature, which is the, the x-axis, the outdoor temperature at which the heat pump below that costs more to operate than the comparative system. And above that, the heat pump costs less. So there's a couple of things to point out here. One is, is that those crossover points happen down below, you know, close to or down below zero degrees. So we're talking cold. This isn't just chilly. This is cold temperatures. Um, and so it looks like there are going to be times of the year where, where you'd be better off running your oil boiler than your heat pump. Well, not your oil boiler, because that one goes off the chart entirely. You'd have to be down at min minus 25 or minus 30, but let's say um, for propane, right? There are going to be times of year when it's less expensive to operate your propane boiler than your heat pump, but there's some more to take into consideration. So I'm going to take you through a couple of charts here. There's going to be a bit of a, a buildup. Bear with me. I, I think the, the ultimate um, um, conclusion will, will be worth the, the trip. So I'm looking at Caribou, Maine. For those of you not familiar with Maine, um, we're first, we're the northeastern state of the northeast. We are the furthest north New England state, and Caribou is in the northeast section of Maine. It is not the furthest north town in Maine. I noticed that there was somebody on the webinar here from Fort Kent. 
um, that's even farther north, but, but caribou's way up there. It is USDA hardiness zone 4B and 4A, which means aside from growing potatoes, it's really hard to grow anything up there. It's really cold. Uh, IECC uh, zone seven, so that's the purple that we saw on those charts before, right? The coldest of the continental uh, contiguous states. Uh, and there's 8,760 hours in a year. Of those, 6,444 6, of them are at or below 60 degrees in Caribou, Maine. So over 6,000 hours in the year require heating. And that works out to when you look at the actual temperature differences to be over 8,000 heating degree days. Um, so it is, it is cold. It is, it is a very cold climate. And on the left side, what you see is a cumulative chart of the hours in the year that are at or below the outdoor temperature that's being displayed. So if you look at zero degrees, there's about 500 hours at or below um, zero degrees. So why, why am I going through this? Why, why do we care? Well, remember those crossover points, right? So if I take the, the temperatures at which those crossover points occur and I zoom in on the chart and I look at those cumulative hours, you can see that natural gas, the crossover points around minus three degrees, there's 300 hours or so that the temperature is below that. Well, that's 5% of the heating hours in caribou. It's not a lot. And for propane, where that crossover happens at minus nine degrees, it's only 1%. So as cold as caribou is, the, that crossover where you would save money to run your traditional system versus a heat pump system, it's actually a very few number of hours. They normally happen in the middle of the night for short durations. And I would not recommend anybody sitting next to their thermostat trying to time switching between systems. And even if it's automated, it's just not worth it. And I'm going to try to convince you that with this chart here. So the bars or the columns on the left chart are the annual operating costs for the various heating systems. So in red is the heat pump. In green is natural gas, a boiler. Purple is propane, a boiler. And oil is the blue, also a boiler. So you can see that, that the heat pump is the least expensive system to operate. And this is assuming heating the whole home all winter long in caribou, right? We're still talking about caribou. In the middle there, you see the cost difference between operating those other systems and a heat pump. So if you ran a heat pump rather than a natural gas boiler, you would save $1,000 a year. Against propane, it's about $1,500, $1,600, and against oil, it's almost $3,400. What if you were sitting by your thermostat and trying to time exactly when your natural gas boiler was less expensive to operate than your heat pump? You were going to squeeze every last nickel out. If you got it perfect, you would save an extra $26 a year. It's immaterial. So... And, and, and this is really important because this is, we're trying to bust a myth that is out there that you need a backup system and that the backup system has to come on at temperatures well above these cutover temperatures that I just talked about. And I've heard recommendations of 20 degrees, 30 degrees and switching back over to your old system. With the current costs of energy, it doesn't make sense. It just, it just doesn't. Um, there just aren't enough hours to make it worthwhile to switch. This chart here, switching entirely, this is no longer caribou. This is another myth that I'm trying to bust, which is we have been told for many, many years, decades, that to save energy, we should turn down our heating systems when we're sleeping. And I'm here to tell you today, for heat, it works great for boilers and furnaces. By all means, keep doing it. It's more comfortable to sleep when it's cooler. You save energy. You can just put an extra blanket on the bed. Go for it. With heat pumps, I wouldn't recommend it. And the reason why I wouldn't recommend it is because of 
the results that I'm showing here, as well as some results that I'll show in some of my later slides. So this is exactly the same configuration of a home run in two different ways. So they ran it with, and there's two heat pumps in this home. The, the red one's on the second floor, the blue one's on the first floor. And the, the line there is the heating degree days. So in the configuration on the left, they picked a comfortable temperature and set it, set it and left it. They, they did not adjust the thermostat in that home. You'll see that the first floor heat pump carried almost all of the load of the home. It was able to satisfy the, the, the indoor temperature request um, through all months with, with very little um, second floor heat pump use. On the right hand side, they were turning off the heat pump at night and turning it back on in the morning. And what you'll see, not only does the second story heat pump have to contribute a lot more to the heating load of the home, but when you look at the sum of both heat pumps, you're looking at almost double the energy use by turning back the temperature at night and turning it back up in the morning. Um, and well, like I'll, I said, I'll, I. I would just add that this this has been game changing in my family because I, I for ten years I've been turning down the or turning off our heat pumps at night. My wife is so thrilled that you know elect, electrification means more comfort, more heating out. If, if you you're more efficient if you run your heat pump all the time, so that's that's amazing, <laughs> amazing stuff. And so now I'm going to jump into um, some evaluations and studies that we've done in Maine. So the first one is our Home Energy Savings Program (HESP). Uh, we did an impact evaluation. Uh, back in 2017, we, we looked at, at homes that are projects that had been completed in the last in the two years previous, and we put meters in the home and we did participant surveys um, and, and got some good good data on heat pump usage and, and heat pump performance in Maine. So the first thing is just satisfaction with heat pumps. So there were actually two programs that participated in this evaluation, the Home Energy Savings Program and um, the Affordable Heat Initiative, which is an income eligible program. So we looked at the results of the, the survey and you can see there's you know, six different categories here on their satisfaction. On a one through five scale, how would they rate these, these different components? And you can see they're all really high and both of the programs were really consistent. Um, folks folks are, are really happy with the heat pumps that they've had installed. And I think that's great, but I want to show the next slide, which shows the usage of the heat pump. So this is this is measuring the kilowatt hours that were used by the heat pump for a typical year. And, and all of these um, bars, each one of them is a home that participated in the study that had good meter data that we could analyze. And it goes from those homes that used the least amount of electricity to those that used the most. And I will point out here that this is not a case of less electricity is more efficient and therefore good. Because if you remember the previous slide where I showed you that heat pump is the least expensive way to heat your home, what's happening in these homes is they're using a heat pump and something, a heat pump and a boiler, a heat pump and a furnace. So the homes where they're not using the heat pump much for heating, they're paying more for the heating than those that are using the heat pump more. So in this case, more usage, the more you use it, it's like a sales pitch, the more you use it, the more you'll save. Uh, and that's absolutely true with heat pumps. And so one of the things that Efficiency Maine has been working on and continues to work on is trying to, 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 trying to figure out not just how to get people to adopt heat pumps and put them in their homes, but how to actually adopt the use of heat pumps and get more out of their heat pump um, every day all winter long. So now to another study. So this was um, existing homes where we looked, we, we recruited homes that used heat pumps solely or primarily as their heating source. So these, these were folks, these are early adopters that decided that they wanted to be an all electric home or close to an all electric home and they installed heat pumps for heating. There were 10 homes that participated Seven of those 10 during the metering that we did in, in February through June of 2021 didn't really use any other heating source. Most of these homes retained 
their existing heating source. So they had boilers, they had furnaces, um, but seven out of 10 homes, it wasn't, it was not significant, the amount of backup heat that they used. Um, and again, these are homes in Maine. Um, we asked how satisfied these folks were. Uh, and I've got some quotes there on the right. I will momentarily be quiet for a little bit so you guys can actually read those quotes. But again, we saw the same thing that we did with the Home Energy Savings Program. Lots of satisfaction. Um, this is each individual home that participated and actually responded to the survey. And I put a couple of, you know, it's always good to have balance, right? So, so there's some really great quotes here. And then, then there's a couple at the bottom, um, you know, might call the, the manufacturer's attention to it. Um, you know, there are still, there are challenges just like with any heating system. Um, so we dug a little bit more into the satisfaction and looked, we asked the, the folks why they were satisfied, what, what drove their satisfaction. And you can see here, this was a, a multiple choice um, response. You can see what, what drove their satisfaction, reliable performance, increased comfort, low operating costs, quiet operation, easy operability, which is funny because of the one person who said the controls are terrible. <laughs> Guess it depends how tech savvy you are. Um, and then again, there's some, some quotes there. I'll, uh, I'll let you guys read those. And I think the one on the bottom is so funny. You know, their, their neighbor didn't like their outdoor unit, so they started blowing snow into it. <laughs> Okay, so this is some meter data, actual usage. This is a home in Gardner, Maine, uh, which is kind of right in the middle of the state. So not the, not the coldest, it's not caribou, um, but still pretty darn cold. Uh, this was um, some metering done in February. Uh, you can see the blue line is the outdoor temperature. You can see, you know, every night it gets cold, it starts to warm up the next day, and then it gets cold again. The red is the indoor temperature. You can see that it mostly stays steady, but there's some dips. I'll talk about those dips in a moment. And then the gray bars there are the electricity use. So I'll draw your attention to a couple of key parts of this chart, right? I mentioned there's that the, the red line, the indoor air temperature where it dips, that is setbacks. This home had a thermostat that had an automatic program in it that set the temperature back every night and then recovered every morning. So what you're seeing is the home is just plodding along right around that daytime set temperature until it gets to the point where the temperature is set back and then the home drifts down. So that drift, the angle of that drift is dependent on how well insulated the home is. Poorly insulated drafty home, that's gonna drop a lot faster. A uh, tight, well-insulated home that would actually drift a lot slower. But that's what you're seeing there. That's why that indoor temperature takes a dip. And then when the system is sort of wakes back up and says, oh, we, we need to go back up to daytime temperatures, you can see it climb. And you can see it climb fairly slowly. Heat pumps, heat pumps are slow heat. They're not fast heat, right? It's like slow money and slow food. Sometimes it's good to wait for things. So heat pumps are slow heat. They're not a furnace. They're not going to blast you. Um, with with ridiculously hot air, um, they're gonna they're just gonna creep up the temperature over time. And the gray bars, as I said, is the electricity use. And what you see is during the day when the temperature is being kept steady, you can see that the heat pump kind of bounces around, it needs a little bit more now, a little bit less, a little bit more, a little bit less. When the setback happens, and the house is allowed to drift the use goes to nothing. It goes to idle, standby, right? You can see that that dip there um, in, in the gray bars that corresponds to the, to the dip in the red line. But then what happens the next morning, probably really early in the morning, right? As you can see here, somewhere in the two o'clock range, 2 a.m., the system says, oh my goodness, we have to get back up to temperature before seven o'clock in the morning and it kicks on and it kicks on hard and it kicks on during the coldest hours of the day. And remember heat pumps are less efficient the colder it is outside because they're extracting heat from that air. The colder the air is, the harder it is to extract that heat. So when you use setbacks on a heat pump, 
You are asking it to work really hard when it is the hardest to work, which leads to inefficiencies. So this is why it's based on this and those other charts that I showed before that Efficiency Maine recommends find a comfortable temperature and leave it there. Leave it there 24-7. If you want to set it back a few degrees at night because you're more comfortable with it a little bit cooler, okay. But don't do drastic changes. You're you're going, I mean, you can for comfort, but don't think you're doing it for efficiency because you're not. Okay, so then my last um, project that I'm going to talk about is a pilot that we're doing with whole home heat pumps. This is ongoing, so I don't have a lot to tell you about it, but I can, I can tell you what we're doing. We are looking at existing homes that do not have heat pumps, that have some sort of existing fossil fuel furnace. Uh, we were focused on furnaces because for, furnaces use forced hot air and heat pumps blow hot air. So we were looking, we were looking for, we're specifically looking for um, drop-in units where applicable and the application of ductless systems um, and, and that distribution with, with multiple indoor units where applicable. So there are 19 homes that are participating um, in this throughout the state, 10 of which are manufactured homes and nine of which are traditional stick built. Um, and in all of these homes, we have either disabled or removed the fossil fuel system. They do not have a fossil fuel system to fall back on. Some of the homes where the heat load of the home is such that the design load of the heat pump is not exactly where we want it to be. We talked about, you know, it's important to size the heat pump for the load of the home. And in some cases, the configuration of the home, it just, you can't quite get there. And in those homes, we put in small, a very small amount of electric resistance as an emergency backup for those coldest days, um, just in case. And while I don't have any um, results to present at this time, I can tell you anecdotally um, that we have not seen a lot of electric resistance use. And we've had some really cold days because I've got, I, I love participant quotes, quotes. So here's some more participant quotes. Uh, you can see that that one of these homes uh, it saw temperatures, outdoor temperatures down to minus 20. Um, and they're working great. That's it. That's my last chart. Oh, fantastic. That's fantastic. Thanks, Laura. Thank Thanks, Sean. So Jonathan. Welcome you guys to come off mute. Yeah, like any good webinar, we are um, over time. We'll go a little bit longer and then we'll, we'll send the recording out to folks just to let you know. A lot of folks were asking about slides and recording. Uh, we will send those both out probably tomorrow. I've got a couple of questions, but Brian, you want to start us off? Yeah, well, and Laura, maybe um, if you could stop sharing your screen, I want to touch really yeah, quickly because sure. uh, I know some people had some questions about um, incentives. So let me let me just really quickly touch on that. If if you go to our website, electrifynow.net, you can find this take action page and you can click on install a heat pump here and you'll get lots of information about how to do that in your own home. But I want to bring your attention to this button down here, this yellow one about IRA incentives, because I know that a lot of people are curious about that. If you were to click on that button on our our website, it will take you to this amazing calculator from Rewiring America, or you can go directly there if you just Google Rewiring America IRA calculator, and you put the your information in about where you live, uh, the amount of uh, income you have in your home, etc., and it'll tell you what sort of incentives are available in terms of tax incentives um, under the IRA plan, uh, which is super useful. And you can also download, if you're interested there, this, this booklet on how to go electric, which gives you kind of step-by-step -step information on um, how to do all the things that we talk about in, in the world of electrification. So I just wanted to touch on that because these incentives are pretty um, pretty amazing. Again, it depends a lot on your household income, but it could be as much as $2,000 in terms of tax incentives for a, a heat pump. And if you need some electrical panel upgrades or something like that as part of it, you could also see some incentives for that. So, all right, let's get into some questions. Yeah, I've got one hand if you're- uh, Go for uh, it. We, you know, and, and folks, you know, uh, obviously you're seeing 90 questions in the Q&A, incredible. Thank you for that. We try to group them into kind of themes. And one thing that was coming through, and we had some earlier discussions on this, um, uh, as a homeowner of an old 
mid-century home, someone wrote in the Q&A, is it best to make improvements to insulation before installing a heat pump system? I wanted to, maybe I'll ask you first, Jonathan, and then other panelists who want to join in as well on that. Yeah, it's, I think it's, the thing about um, heating and cooling, especially in older homes, is it's so, kind of site specific. Um, I can tell you, I did not, I live in a 1916, uh, home and we put heat pumps in and ripped out our gas furnace before we insulated and air sealed. And um, we then went back and did a home uh, energy retro retrofit and, and our house is more comfortable and our electric bills running heat pumps are less. But, um, you know, I think if you're a perfect, you could have a house where you'll spend much more on a heat pump to achieve comfort. And if you insulate first, you'll need a smaller heat pump. And so it costs less to get the heat pump in. And that's why you really do need to have someone do what's called a load calculation on the house as built today. And then one with some of the improvements and be able to make an intelligent decision. That being said, if your priority is decarbonization and um, you know, you're know you on a budget, uh, you get to choose. Um, you could put in heat pumps first and then go, go back and improve. Um, and when you do this with a cold climate variable capacity heat pump, I think you'll not trigger some of the consequences of having um, a heat pump that it might be relatively oversized if you reduce the load through insulation later. These variable capacity machines at least can adjust to that condition whereas the older generations of heat pump can't. So anyway, I said a lot, I'll stop there. Yeah, I think that's great. It's just a big question. Um, I think mean, just, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Laura. Yeah, if I could jump in just super quick on that. You know, we've run some numbers and done some analysis on it. And in most cases, dollar for dollar, you're going to have a bigger impact and a larger carbon reduction putting in a heat pump than you will insulating. I'm not hmm. saying don't insulate, but if if you've if you only have you know five grand ten grand to spend and you have to decide whether or not to insulate or put in a heat pump, the heat pump will have more impact in That's almost all cases. That's interesting. Yeah, it's good it's to know. Quick, good quick to know. add to that: um, the load domin or determines the the capacity needed. I've got a friend in Sten Denver, double brick house built in 1928. And, um, you know, he's done some air sealing improvements, but it's, you know, it's still a pretty average brick home. And um, the heat pump he's got is doing the job. He's got a backup fireplace if he needs to seal combustion, but, you know, got to do the math. Yeah, I, actually, I wanted to ask, that's great. I wanted to ask on that exact thing because the load calculation seems to be a really central part of this. And, you know, I think if you, I, I, I know that if you have a good, competent contractor they're going to do this. But if you're a homeowner, how do you know that the contractor you're working with has done a good job on load calculations? Is there any tips you can give to, to homeowners the so that first, they know that they're they're getting the right thing? I think the first thing to ask the contractor is, have you done a load assessment? Because you say a good, competent contractor will do that. That is not standard practice, actually. Hmm. Ask them to talk these, about... Their, their so is, it, is, it, load is it something you can see? Can you say, can you ask them, can I see the load calculation you've done? It seems like even if they have a, if they have a piece of paper to show yeah. you, at least then, then it's better evidence that they've done it rather than just, oh yeah, oh, I did it. <laughs> is that a good question to ask? I think so. I mean, you know, there's, there's manual J there's, there's um, what's the other one? Um, res something or other, right? I mean, there's, there's software and there's manual calculations available that, should have a product that is displayable. Right, right. Yeah. Um, well, on that note, you know, of contractors, and I know that we talked ahead of time, Sean, uh, you wanted to kind of mention something, but I want to give you a chance to do that and just talk about the workforce uh, situation. What do we need to vastly scale up heat pump installations, you know, nationally? Yeah, uh, I mean, a, a little bit of a soapbox here. I, I think that... Um, I will ask everybody that's still on this on this call in this session, if you know, find out what work skilled trade workforce programs are in your area and promote them, support them. Uh, if you know somebody who's looking at a career change or getting into a, a new career, 
uh, encourage them to consider to skilled trade. They're good jobs. They are well paid. They are, in my opinion, they're pretty future proof because we still need hands on capabilities to interface with the digital and the AI future that we are heading towards. Right. So there's it. I don't think we truly grasp the how underskilled we are as a nation and as a world for that matter, what we are heading into, right? The, the massive transition we're heading towards. And just like decarbonization, this is a must have, not a nice to have, not it's a gotta have. And so please encourage skilled trade workforce development in your areas, whatever that might look like. Any tricks from uh, Efficiency Maine, Laura, on, on the workforce uh, front? You know, Maine has a really strong workforce when it comes to heat pumps. We, One of our, our biggest installers used to be an appliance store that saw what was happening with heat pumps and has completely transitioned their business. And they're now one of the biggest heat pump installers in Maine. And they are constantly recruiting and they do a bunch of like on the job training and interning kind of things. Uh, so, so we have an incredibly strong workforce in Maine, which is why we're able to install, you know, 35,000 heat pumps a year in a state that only has 1.5 million people. So I, I, I don't know. I mean, we do, Efficiency Maine does offer support to contractors. We we have training scholarships. We have some equipment scholarships. Uh, so, so we are doing what we can to support the contractor community. But I think a lot of it is just the fact that we have um, a lot of demand in the state and demand drives supply. That's great to hear. I wanted to return um, to the to the dual fuel question for just a second, um, because uh, the way you know, there's a lot of conversation about that. I think in a lot of places, in fact, here in in the Northwest, the um, gas utilities are starting to promote that as a way for them. I think for them to stay in business. But the it, I just want to clarify, you know, what I think I'm hearing from you guys today, which is that. Yes, dual fuel is a legitimate path if you have a heat pump that is not capable of achieving these this cold climate kind of high capacity output. But if you have a cold climate heat pump, you don't necessarily need a dual fuel system with the, maybe the exception like you were talking about, Laura, of, of emergency heat strips or maybe auxiliary you know, heat units in a bathroom, maybe that isn't well serviced by your 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 airflow system. Is that correct? Is that fair to say? That's what we're seeing in new construction in Maine and, and retrofits. I mean, you know, homeowners have taken it upon themselves to 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 get off of their oil system, and and they've done it with heat pumps or heat pumps with small amount of electric resistance. We've seen it. It it can it can happen because it's happening. From my perspective, uh, the dual fuel solution is a transition technology. You know, it's it's a it's gets us to fifty to ninety to ninety nine percent reduction of natural gas use, for example, uh, over the next you know for the life of that equipment. And twenty years down the road, fifteen years down the road, when it's time or available, the skilled the trade base is there. The the cost structures have kind of normalized across heat pumps as a central technology. Um, I think we'll see a very different picture. That's helpful. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think with the dual fuel, the um, the piece that utilities are concerned about, even in places that aren't that cold, is that their grid isn't as renewable full, and they would rather see. You know, a furnace burning um, natural gas at ninety some odd percent efficiency towards heat, and instead of burning that gas to make electricity and having a only be thirty percent efficient, roughly, and then, and so I think that that's kind of some of the thinking that utilities are making, or the, at least the justification. Uh, at least, at thinking as a contractor, though, I mean, even in extraordinarily cold places if you don't have enough heat from a heat pump and you think, well, I want to go to backup, the option is to put another heat pump in. And so in my house, I had one large heat pump and it didn't make sense. And so I pulled off some of the heads on one multi large multi-zone and have two or three small heat pumps that do the lion's share of the heating. 
and then we turn on these other zones. We, so we have three heat pumps at our house. They're yeah. tiny. They don't make much noise. The smaller ones use less like energy per, they have a greater efficiency. I, I do want to comment on that, you know, Jonathan, because I know there's some questions in the chat about this too, about the, well, aren't we trading off burning, you know, gas in our homes for burning gas somewhere else to make electricity that's less efficient and stuff like that. And that's a myth that is very popular out there that a lot, the gas utilities really will will, will help to prom promulgate. But you know, I, I think I, I brought that attention to your attention to that study from UC Davis at the beginning of the, of the program where they looked at every part of the United States and in every part of the United States, a heat pump will produce fewer emissions than a than the most efficient gas furnace available. So that is just like kind of like out there as a thing, but and, re and also remember that, you know, the grid is literally getting cleaner every minute as people put solar panels on their roofs, as more community solar gets put up, as, as more wind, like driving around here in the Northwest, you can't drive on the freeways without seeing a new wind turbine being shipped to a new destination. So uh, I think it's fair, I think everyone on this call should be comfortable to know that a heat pump is going to produce fewer emissions in any fossil fuel based system anywhere in the United States. So we can only, as consumers, we can only control what we control. And it's up to us to put heat pumps in our homes. And then it's up to the utilities who are regulated by governments to produce less carbon over time. So I think there's a little bit of a circular argument that goes around with this subject of dual fuel. Put a heat pumps in your house, heat with heat pumps in the coldest place, Maine. They can do it. Yeah, we can do it everywhere. Great. Yeah, and, and just, just to be clear, heat pump technology is capable of heating basically any building in any major city anywhere at this point. The technology is there. If you're looking at a dual fuel, it's because there are gaps that are that apply to your personal situation that you're just not willing to go to that next step, or maybe you can't go to the next step. I totally get that. Yeah. Um, but yeah. it is, I look at it as a transition technology, and the technology's already there when you're ready to take the take the make the move. Love it. Joe, we're probably we're quite a bit over time here. I really appreciate all this from our panel. Any last questions or should we should wrap it up? Uh, I think, uh, well, I, I had a couple more. Let's do one real quick. Uh, folks were interested on resilience. Uh, you know, if the grid goes down, any, any thoughts on, on, on resilience and heat pumps um, to take us home? Yeah, I would just, the first thing I would point out is that there are very few heating systems utilized in, in homes in the U.S. that don't rely on electricity in some way, shape, or form. So if you don't have a generator, and the power goes out and you have a furnace, you have no heat. If you have a boiler, you have no heat. The difference with a heat pump is that it will require a larger generator and it will require a generator that provides good clean energy, electricity, right? It, it's gotta have an, a good signal. So, so it does, th there is a complication there, but it's, it's, People are like, oh, you know, I, you, you can't have a heat pump if you have power outages. How is it any different if you don't have a generator and you have a furnace? You're still not going to have heat. And, and I can tell you in, in Maine, where we are subject and prone to power outages, most homes have wood stoves because wood stoves do not require electricity. Um, so that is a very popular emergency heat supply in Maine. Yeah, it's it's part of a broader question of you know what tools do you have to to be resilient, and I will give you one story um, out of Colorado. A uh, little little less than a year ago, there was a major fire in Boulder County that took out 1,100 homes in eight hours. It was the most destructive fire in Colorado's history. A friend of mine who is a passive house builder, he has a retrofit house that he's upgraded to passive levels, not specifically, um, you know, built passive house. He was back in his house three days after the fire with a heat pump, with a cold climate heat pump, because the utility company was able to turn on the electricity to his block sooner than gas. Some people got into homes with electricity weeks before some of the gas was turned on. Now, I might, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, say one thing or the other, but the, it it enables you to be more flexible in more ways, uh, I think, than relying on um, a, a system that the utility company might not even be happy to turn on because 
who knows what's involved with that line somewhere along the line. And I just see, I, I, I see it giving you more choices, not less. I, I lived through the San Francisco earthquake in the late eighties and early nineties there. We lost you, Brian. It was the Can't same thing. You, the electricity comes back on almost immediately. The gas took months. Um, okay. Well, maybe, uh, maybe we should wrap it up, Joe. Yeah. Cause, and I, I really want to thank all of our um, attendees for hanging in there with us. And, um, uh, Thank you again to all our amazing panelists. This has been fantastic. I learned a lot and I really appreciate you, you guys taking time to tell us about all the good things that are going on in Daikin and Mitsubishi and in Maine. So thank you very much. And uh, Joe. Have a great, happy holidays to everyone. But yeah, huge thanks to the panelists. And Brian, leave us with our favorite. Yeah, so uh, I appreciate all you out there who are on your own journey towards electrification. We thank you and congratulations on what you've done and good, good, good luck with all your electrification projects going forward and feel free to contact us. If you ever have questions, if we can't answer it, we will find someone who can. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thanks all. Bye everyone.